been studying for the last six or seven years the idea, the concept of the blue economy, uh, supported in my research by CMSI, the Ruga Chair, and others, uh, for which I'm grateful. Uh, and I'm looking at China's science, technology, innovation strategies in this regard. Uh, and that's why I met Michael, Mr. Michael Jones. He's a, a, a leading figure in this area. Uh, he's the founder and president of TMA Blue Tech. TMA was the Maritime Alliance, now TMA Blue Tech. It is a nonprofit cluster founded in 2007. Uh, its mission is promoting sustainable science-based ocean and water industries. Uh, it's focused or headquartered in San Diego. It is today the largest U.S. blue tech ocean and water tech cluster. Uh, it has a growing number of members across the U.S. and abroad. And Michael's going to tell us about the evolution of, of this cluster and, of course, its importance uh, to not just the U.S. economy, uh, but also to our national security and military concerns. Uh, Michael's a businessman and investor, scholar, and pioneer in this area, so uh, he has a lot to share with us. In fact, uh, when uh, we opened up our, our email listserv group, our Ocean Maritime Security Group, OMSG, to our current uh, War College students, we had a flood of inquiries about his 2018 lecture. So we've asked him to come back and update us, and he's graciously agreed. Before I turn it over, though, to Michael, just a few announcements. We are recording the talk portion of this lecture. Uh, and we may be sharing it beyond the War College community, so we'll let you know if you're interested in a video copy or you'll see it on the YouTube website if we choose to do that. Uh, we will be turning off the recording uh, at the Q&A session. Uh, in the meantime, though, please follow our usual Chatham House rules, which is you can discuss what was said, but please don't attach any comments to any personalities. Uh, and because this might be on videotape, uh, the required disclaimer is, of course, that nothing said during this lecture are the views of the U.S. Navy, Navy War College, Department of Defense or U.S. government, but personal views of those who are making those comments. Uh, we will have muted everyone during the presentation part of the lecture, uh, but we, what we're going to do at the end for the Q&A, we're going to moderate the Q&A via the chat function. Uh, so we, we're leaving the chat function open throughout the presentation, so please start asking your questions as they arise at, throughout Michael's presentation, but we'll ask them of him at the back end. Uh, and before I uh, pass it over, let me just thank uh, Laura Cavallero for all of her assistance in making this possible, uh, and will be our backup in case something else happens, uh, another power outage, uh, and also to Captain Dr. Andrea Cameron for her advice as well. Uh, this is uh, another in our Blue Economy lecture series. Uh, I hope to have more in the coming weeks, so please stay tuned for announcements uh, in that regard. With that, Michael, I'm going to turn it over to you for your presentation, uh, now titled Importance of Blue Tech Clusters for Growing Sustainable U.S. Blue Economy and the Impact on the U.S. Military. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. Um, thanks very much for the invitation. It's a really a pleasure to be with you. Um, uh, Kate invited me, uh, actually Kate called in, a couple of years ago and said that she wanted to come and visit and uh, we had a really great conversation and it was wonderful to see her interest both to see what China was doing in the blue economy, uh, but also her interest from the Naval War College point of view in the importance of the blue economy and blue tech. And, and so uh, I really appreciate the fact that she has taken the time um, to focus on something that I think is incredibly important to the country, uh, to DOD, um, but in, in many different ways. And what I'd like to do is if they will allow me to share my screen, uh, I will run you through kind of a little bit about why is it that that uh, uh, we don't appreciate more the ocean. Um, what are we doing about it, we TMA Blue Tech? And then I'll end up with some comments about why I think it's really important for, I'll say the government writ large, but also of course uh, the, uh, uh, the US Navy and Marine Corps, those that are, have, have more wet um, uh, applications and operations. Um, so I'm gonna run through this relatively quickly to make sure that we have time for Q&A. So if I can share my screen, let me see. Okay. Is that popping up for everybody? Somebody give me a thumbs up, please. Yes, yes, yes. it is, sir. You're, you're good. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, again, my name is Michael Jones. I'm the founder and president of TMA Blue Tech. And what I'd like to talk to you about is the importance of blue tech and blue tech clusters for a growing sustainable US blue economy, world economy for that matter, and then why is it important to the military? 
So first of all, just a, a note, I haven't updated this for a little while, but the OECD, which is, as many of you may know, is the think tank of democracies of the world, did its first ever study in 2016. And they said that because they didn't have the ability to gather as much information about blue tech, it was primarily traditional uses, they came up with a $1.5 trillion in 2010 for the ocean economy um, and three, expected to be $3 trillion by 2030. Now that's faster growth than the rest of the economy. And if you compare that to 2010 or 15, the global water industry or the space industry, both of which have a lot more people focused on them uh, and a lot more funding that have gone into them, you can see that this ocean economy is very big. So why is it that the first ever study was 2016 for the ocean economy? To show you how little we really know about how big the blue economy is, the world, the global economy is about $80 trillion, at least when I looked this up about, oh, six months ago, I was giving a talk to, at the uh, National Academy of Sciences. They'd never really done an event on, uh, on kind of the blue economy They'd done some very specific things, but they wanted me to come and talk to them about why the blue economy was important. Uh, then earlier this year, they did an event um, uh, that kind of followed on my presentation to their advisory committee. But if you look at this, this is now UNCTAD, Party of the United Nations. They say that the global ocean-based economy is between $3 trillion and $6 trillion, and more than 3 billion people rely on the ocean. Well, 3, three to $6 trillion uh, that means three trillion already versus the three trillion it might be in 2030. So we really don't know, but these are very big numbers. And then in the lower left-hand corner, that big box, you see something that Noah looked at, and the and the global the water the ocean economy is growing about twice as fast as the U.S. economy in general. So if you look to the lower right-hand corner. And, and you begin to say, even at $3 trillion, which is the lower end of the estimated range, that would make it the equivalent of the fifth largest country in the world. And yet we don't really know because we don't gather the information really on the ocean economy the way we have done on many economies on land. And again, just to underline this, in 2012, we did our first study in San Diego. And San Diego is a city that was found by ocean um, when the Spanish came, came a knocking on the door uh, through the San Salvador. They came ashore in San Diego, claimed it for the, for the Spanish crown. Um, and most people didn't come by wagon train or train to San Diego, they came by ocean. And so, and we're a city built around the Navy. And yet nobody had ever studied the value of the blue economy in San Diego. So we did that in 2012. Um, unfortunately, we haven't been able to get the funding to update our study. I'll give you a little more detail in a few minutes. Uh, but when you look at this kind of step function, I told you about the OECD study, the first ever global ocean economy study, 2016. We were the co-authors of NOAA's first ever study on the value of ocean observation, 2016. The United Nations did its first ever ocean conference in 2017. The EU did its first Blue Invest Day in 2017. Kenya, for, uh, for, with the United Nations, did a African Sustainable Blue Economy Conference, first time. EU did its first Blue Economy Study, 2018. Second Blue Economy Study, 2019. They did their second Blue Invest Day in the Mediterranean, 2019. Uh, National Academy of Sciences, I mentioned before. White House did its first ever the Trump White House did its first ever event in the White House um, or in the executive office next to the White House uh, in uh, November of 2019. I was one of, I think, about 115 or 16 people that were invited. Um, and then in 2020, the second Blue Invest Day in Brussels, uh, I was invited to represent the whole U.S. capital market, which was kind of a hoot. Uh, but there were hundreds of people there uh, because the EU is really focused on the blue economy, blue tech, what they call blue growth. Uh, and they've done a wonderful job really promoting blue invest. Uh, and then there was supposed to be the second UN Glo uh, Ocean Conference in June of 2020. That was obviously postponed because of, of COVID. But I want you just to see what a compressed time frame is that around the world, people are saying, oh my God, there's this big blue thing out there and it's really important. And I think that 
speaks volumes of out of sight, out of mind, but it also, I think, is a harbinger of the importance of the work that Kate is doing and War College is doing, and hopefully all of you will help her do in the future. Um, I think this is a very important slide because this shows, everything that's blue shows the um, exclusive economic zone that's owned by a country. And so you look off to the left and you see lots of islands, my, you know, Micronesia, the Marshall Islands, even Portugal, New Zealand, they have far more blue than they have brown, which is their land mass. And you come toward the middle and you see United States and Australia, we have more ocean as part of our EEZs than we do land mass. You start moving further right and now you understand Iran and China from a geopolitical point of view. You say it's no wonder that South China Sea is so incredibly important. It's no wonder that they have long range fishing uh, fleets because they frankly don't have access the way we do in the United States. The, the enormous amounts of area that are under our economic control. I think this, this, this slide is incredibly important uh, because I think it helps one understand graphically, very quickly, viscerally, uh, why the ocean is important. And, and as we have the economic, sorry, as we have the technical prowess to go exploit the ocean, we've always done fishing, we know that, but there's so much more, whether it's mining or it's aquaculture, um, uh, it is uh, uh, understanding the ocean in new ways, it's new biomedicines, uh, uh, the whole area of biomarine, which will be trillions of trillions of dollars. All these people over in the far right are really poor in the sense they don't have as much ocean to play with. So, in the, in the 60s, NOAA and NASA's budgets were about the same. Uh, NASA has done a wonderful job of storytelling. Um, NOAA isn't allowed to do the same. Uh, many of you will have heard of Bob Ballard, the guy who found the Titanic, uh, he and his team, a uh, world-class explorer, um, and his comment. Now, if you show this to somebody from NASA, they'll say yes, but we fund a lot of stuff for NOAA, which is really true. But it's still a very interesting the exploration budget at NOAA is quite small compared to, uh, to NASA. Again, I'm not trying to make any qualitative or quantitative judgments here. I just think it's important that we have a tendency to take the ocean for granted. And I think it's very important that we understand the value of this economy and the importance to the country as well. So just a word about our study 2012. Um, Normally, for those of you that are economic, uh, uh, you know, kind of uh, industry people, you would understand the next codes, which is the Na North American Industrial Classification System, which of course will change now that we have the new agreement between Canada, Mexico, and the United States. But normally, you would you would um, go to a next code, and it would lead you to companies. In our case. We found we had to find the companies and then say, what next code have you been assigned or what was assigned to you? This is unheard of to have 200 next codes to look at an industry. Again, we could not have gone to a next code and found the industry. We found, we found the companies. Now of those 1,431 companies, 700 plus self-reported that they had a maritime focus and 350 reported over 75%. Nobody had ever done this study, and we found 46,000 direct jobs, not indirect as well, and 14 plus billion dollars of annual direct sales. Again, as an economist, you would say, okay, what's the overall economic impact? You'd look at direct, indirect, and induced to really understand the overall impact. And I'll show you something about that in a minute. This was done on 2011 uh, numbers. Again, we've not had the funding to uh, go forward to do an updated study. We are hopefully getting close to doing that. Um, if you look at what NOAA came up with, and again, this is in absolutely no way a slight because the only six sectors that are covered by the next codes, which I just talked about, are marine construction, living resources, offshore minerals, ship and boat building, tourism, recreation, marine transportation. And so they looked at the city of San Diego, or the, the county of San Diego and said 5.8 billion. 
But if you take out tourism and recreation, which we do not include in our study, it was only 2.1 billion. So our 14 billion was 6.7 times what NOAA says. Again, NOAA is, does an amazing job. I have nothing for ad admiration. They're taking US government economic data, which is assist essentially systematically undercounting um, the value of the blue economy in the United States. Um, we did a, a little study. One of our member companies gave us uh, some funding and we then did a study on what's the overall uh, calcul uh, multiplier, which is this issue of, of direct, indirect, and, and induced jobs. And what they found, again, we didn't do this study. We got the funding for it. It was an MBA capstone project at San Diego State University, our largest university. And so it was a very small sample size of two companies, but the owners basically gave us access to their whole supplier list and a team of companies under the tutelage of two really good professors that done a lot of work in the supply chain and multiplier did this study. And they came out and said, of the $40 million generated, just in the city of San Diego is a 1.74 multiplier. The state, it sounded the county was 2.15 and the state was 2.59. Now, a closed loop system is about three because essentially you're saying 100% of the dollars are direct or then they show up as indirect and they show up as induced. And, and so it, it is, uh, the higher that number, the better it is. And then they looked at it vis-a-vis -vis other industries they had studied. And so um, total, uh, you can see your output multiplier and then pharma, biotech, healthcare, tourism. Again, these were not our numbers. These were the numbers that San Diego State team came up with. Whether that's the right number or not isn't the point. The point is that there is an amazing multiplier in blue tech. Because when I go out and buy a wire, you know, to, to create a, a, a wet matable connection, or because I'm doing a ROV and I need a thousand meters of, of tether, um, that you buy the copper from somewhere, you buy the cop, you buy the the, um, uh, the plastic from somewhere, you mold that, it then goes into another product. So you basically create subsystems. So it's a very high multiplier, which means blue tech is one of those industries that you should love if you understood it in more detail. I think this is the, and I, was, I said this really the National Academy of Sciences, because this is the time for us in the United States to be bold. There are so many industry sectors and within the military, you've got many, many sectors as well. You may not have aquaculture sitting over here, but you know that food security is incredibly important. It's a fast growth industry. I hope I showed you that by one of the earlier slides. It's huge potential for the United States. You know that uh, because 71% uh, um, of the world's surface is ocean, but 98 to 99% of habitable earth is underwater. 98 to 99% of habitable earth is underwater. I was uh, participating in a NATO Portuguese Navy event yesterday, uh, part of a big exercise that got canceled this year called RepMUS uh, 2020. And one of the admirals was saying that 98% of all of the uh, world's uh, traf um, uh, uh, voice traffic and communications goes underwater via cables, which of course with the um, with the technology moving as rapidly as possible is very vulnerable today. So while it is fast growth and it has huge potential for the world, it also has, creates vulnerabilities, which is where of course navies and, and DOD come, on, come in. So all these things, underwater communications, unmanned systems, marine and survey vessels, hydro, all of these are of great importance. Again, forget aquaculture, think food security. High economic multiplier, which I just talked about. The US is still a global leader, but as Kate can tell you, uh, the Chinese, for example, have been pouring money into to promoting blue tech centers uh, in China. Uh, Europe uh, has identified uh, 15 years ago, um, uh, plus more, I would say, about this. Uh, we um, uh, started working in kind of some of the blue tech areas about the same time as the EU. But when I say the EU, we're, we're tiny. The EU has put a lot of funding into a lot of research to do some really great work. Um, but the United States is a traditional leader here and, and should continue to be a leader. 
Um, there's global impact with partner clusters around the world. I'm going to talk about clusters in a few minutes. Um, big problems or big opportunities, which I'll talk about in a minute. And of course, I think if any of us have children or grandchildren or nephews, it's the right thing to do. We need to take care of the ocean at somewhere between every uh, one of every two and two out of every three breaths comes from uh, bacteria in the ocean, essentially. Um, we need to unleash innovation to address important issues. First of all, we should be talking about the circular economy. And then we need to think about cleanup of the ocean. You know, for decades, we threw nuclear waste in the ocean. And today, you can go down and pick that up if you want to. There's phantom netting many places. There's plastics, we know, because that's the issue that we have probably heard the most about. Um, there's sunken vessels from the Second World War with oil on board. And someday, we are going to have a catastrophic uh, rupture that's going to ruin the economy of some South Pacific uh, country. And if we would, if we decided that that politically, socially, economically, morally, we should go out and and find some of those vessels and and clean them up, we would create jobs, and it would be doing the right thing and also avoiding much more expensive cleanup. There's unexploded ordnance in many places, um, not least of which the Baltic Sea, where there's estimates of hundreds of thousands of mines still floating around and, and an untold number of shells that were dumped because nobody thought we would get to them before. And we, of course, can easily today. Uh, we believe in floating infrastructure. There'll be airports, desal plants, energy plants, ports, um, uh, to spend money on building a billion dollar desal plant, which in 20, 30, 40 years will be under attack from the ocean. Um, doesn't matter who did it, um, God or man, um, we know that oceans are rising. Um, so we need to be thinking about floating infrastructure. It's, we think, incredibly important. Uh, some years ago, I went to, um, to, to um, uh, Department of Transportation and um, told them what we were doing. And they said, oh, you're the second person that's been here to talk to us. And I said, oh, who's the first? They said, this guy from Lawrence Livermore National Laboratories. And at the time, we had been under, under non-disclosure agreement as we had worked with Lawrence Livermore looking at large uh, uh, floating ports, which frankly, the private sector would pay for. But it would be a little bit like at what happened after 9-11. Uh, I'd rather, God forbid, there was a dirty bomb if it went off in, Los in the ports of Long Beach, Los Angeles, we would be at a standstill. If it was a floating port 20 miles offshore, um, it would be a terrible, terrible, terrible thing, uh, but it would be something that we could deal with. And all these things around this, this was actually a, this was something put together by Lawrence Livermore. These are wind energy, and in here are uh, ICBP related activities to make sure that you come in you delouse the, uh, not delouse, you, um, what do you call it? Um, demagnetize the vessels that they come in. You then bring the ocean going vessels on one side and you bring in the, then the ones that are gonna go to, um, to your small ports. You revitalize the ports, you work on short sea shipping. So again, lots of, lots of political, uh, economic ramifications of things like this. And it's, it's where we need to go. To add insult to injury, a few years ago, the Chinese offered to build an offshore port for us on the East Coast, uh, which really didn't go very far, fortunately. Um, there's a lot of ocean noise. Uh, we have the ability today to understand ocean noise. It's not just military. It's all those vessels, bigger and bigger vessels. If we don't understand it, how do we, you know, if you can't understand a problem, it's hard to come up with a solution to a problem. Salt intrusion, you know, this whole area of saline farming and what's happening in the Mekong Delta uh, in the in countries in Jordan, in Bangladesh, uh, these are moving people uh, because they can no longer farm because of salt intrusion. And uh, there are other countries that are spending a lot more time and 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 focus on things like saline farming. Um, so these are big problems that uh, that we can turn into opportunities where we can deal with them. And I always like to draw the analogy with with uh, the Netherlands, which uh, Nederland, as you may know, means low country. And, and so the Dutch have lived with probably half of their country underwater, under sea level, for a long time. And so they are a world leader in, in working on, 
on uh, dredging and, and trying to figure out how to protect what they have. They also build their cities. So when, when there's water, it then is captured and the runoff, if it's fresh water, can be utilized and the rest is funneled back into the ocean. They've done things because they've had to live with it. So again, these are definitely problems. Nobody likes to deal with problems and they're costly problems. But if we look at them as opportunities where we can, we can create industries and we can sell that around the world and do good, then I think we'd be much further, further along. An amazing photo as far as I'm concerned that uh, is uh, both cute and frightening at the same moment. Okay, what's a cluster? Why are they important? A business cluster is a regional concentration of related industries. For us, an organized cluster is when you really understand regional recognition, funding, and leadership intersect. Effective leadership is critical. We believe that effective blue tech clusters should focus on the triple bottom line, people, planet, profit, and they balance economic, environmental, social equity factors. Um, and we are both tech and service companies. And if we don't use blue tech, we cannot understand the magnitude of the problems, let's just say plastics as an example, um, and then figure out how to solve it. The plastic isn't just gonna go away. So we have to figure out wh what's the extent of the problem and how do we deal with it. This is us, uh, we were founded in 2017, we're in our 14th year. We are a strategic partner with the US Department of Commerce. We were a recipient of the first ever ocean technology uh, funding from the US government. Um, it's got the terrible name of Market Development Cooperator Program. Approximately 100 members, as Kate said, our mission statement is to promote sustainable science-based ocean and water industries. Our tagline is promoting blue tech and blue jobs. And so we're at our core an industry association. We care about sustainability. We care about science-based, which means replicable ocean and water industries. We care about doing what's right for the ocean and water we care about doing what's right for the world. Um, to us, blue tech is all things wet. Um, and I, I'm just gonna highlight a couple of these. These are important things for us. We're very broad. I'll show you that in a minute. Um, from an open ocean observation point of view, we believe we have to change the math. And by the way, you know, in a resource constrained world, um, uh, the Navy needs to think about this. Marine Corps has to think about changing the math for whatever they wanna do. We just can't do things the way we used to do them, but it's just as important in science, government, industry as well. Blue economy, space economy interface is very important. It provide, provides real-time comms. And then ocean observation and blue tech are essential for humans to address what we call the big five, food, water, medicine, energy, and real estate. And then you've got what I would like to think of as very important, but I hope transitory problems like abandoned netting, plastic, sunken vessels. Again, these are, these are not trivial issues, but we have the technology to go find and remove these, but we have to have the will and the funding to do so. Um, international collaboration is crit critical. These problems and these markets are way too big for any country to deal with alone. Uh, we're very broad. As I said, if it's wet, it's blue. Um, you can see here 16 sectors. We, we are a mile wide and, and about two inches deep. There's no way that we are specialists in all these fields, but we, we try and bring people together. One of the biggest problems for us has been getting people in disparate sectors within blue tech to understand why they should help each other. And I'm in biomedicine. Why should I help somebody in, in, in robotics? Well, frankly, because those robotics are going to help you uh, find uh, the medicines or harvest whatever it is uh, in, a, in a sustainable way. And by the way, at the end of the day, a chorus is always better than a single voice because it's louder. There are more people with more connections. And, and think about us as bringing disparate voices together to try and create a what we call a blue voice region by region. This was a study, we didn't do this, 2016, the San Diego Regional Economic Development Corporation, but you can see in the lower right-hand corner, of course in blue, our study. And then you can look at these other, uh, other industries. Again, this was not us doing the work, but where we talked only direct jobs, uh, 
not indirect and induced, when they say direct economic impact, total economic impact, it's really, un it's hard to imagine that that isn't a full economic impact, whereas what we were talking about was just direct jobs, direct industry. So it's a big industry. Nobody had any clue about the size of the blue economy and blue tech in San Diego until we did that study. Um, this is an older slide. You even see a, um, a, uh, our old logo there. Um, uh, Kate alluded to that. That was our former name. Uh, same logo, uh, but here are just around the world, you know, French, Mexican, uh, this is um, Ireland, uh, Spain, uh, Inter-American Committee on Ports, part of the American, uh, the uh, um, uh, Inter-American, uh, uh, oh God, um, part of the, the Inter-American Committee on Ports and, and uh, the EIS uh, in Washington, D.C. So we deal with lots of companies around the world, organizations around the world. Uh, some areas of particular TMA focus, uh, we think for the future, uh, K through 12 education is critical. Um, promoting blue tech clusters and chapters around the world, capacity building, we think is very important. All of these things are important. You know, attracting more capital is very important. At the end of the day, to study the ocean, to understand the ocean, we have to drive down the price of platforms and sensors. And one of the disadvantages the Navy, uh, the DOD deals with is the, the, the very uh, uh, cumbersome acquisition system. It's very hard to be nimble. Uh, and I think we note that uh, when we went to places like Iraq and Afghanistan and the people we were fighting were using off the shelf GPS and things like that and we were uh, struggling to stay up with the change. The, the, the change. So there are lots of companies that are not in the DOD orbit uh, just because it takes long and it's, it's hard to be seen. Uh, they often don't have the, the right admirals and generals on their boards. Um, but our goal as an organization and our companies is drive down the price of platforms and sensors. I'll come back to that, why I think it's important for the military. Um, here is a representation of, the, of a cluster. I mean, we bring together academia, industry, policy, and in the middle, we sit. Each of those we have to talk to differently because their interests, which is what you see here, here, and here, they're different. But where they overlap is the needs and the solutions, economic growth, and jobs. So we talk about a regional blue voice, and we promote a blue opportunity. And to do that, we have to align stakeholder interests. I'm going to spend a minute talking, a couple of minutes talking about, uh, about um, um, education because we think it's critically important. Uh, we spend probably 25% of our time on workforce development uh, and, 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 and educational development. There's a lot of things that we have done, but I'll focus on this one. When COVID hit, um, we uh, had, um, we, we trademarked we, you know, we were the first people, I think, to really use blue tech in certainly the United States. Um, we talk about blue STEM. We didn't trademark a lot of these things because we wanted people to use them, but we used, wanted to trademark aqua optimism because we are both ocean and water. While we're primarily, I think, talking about ocean today, again, we are our feet in both areas and, and there's a finite amount of water in the world and it's either in a cloud or it's under, underground or it's out in that great big ocean. 97% of the world's water sits. So we're interested in all that. Um, so we decided that we were going to put a curriculum together. And so we are just finishing a phase one, which is a TK through 12, so 13 grades uh, curriculum and a resource matrix. Uh, we've talked to UNESCO, part of the United Nations. Uh, it's possible that we're going to get some funding to translate that into some other languages. Our goal is to roll this out. It's pretty exciting to see teachers and, and curriculum writers look at this. And, 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 and just one example, I'm part of a leadership team from the San Diego Unified School District, and that SDUSD is 105,000 students, K through 12 students. So it's the second largest school district in the state of California, and we are their essentially blue tech partner to bring blue STEM in. And, and one of the middle school teachers stood up and said, I know every teacher in the middle school and the high school, but when they finish, I don't remember her grade, let's just say up to seventh grade, uh, sorry, uh, fifth grade, sixth grade, wherever she was, sixth grade, let's say, 
uh, and then I say goodbye, and they go off to the next teacher. By having a light motif, a theme, they can work together. And so things build on each other. And if you think about the ocean, whether it's math or it's reading or it's science or uh, whatever it is, writing, uh, it's drawing, it's, uh, uh, it's healthcare, the ocean has impacted it and is impacting it. So we are finishing a, a curriculum that we hopefully will be uh, adopted and we're now beginning to put together phase two funding. Why does that impact the military? Because it's hard to get people to understand the value of the ocean. And if you see this as a place, my gosh, you, could, you too could see the world and then come back out and there's a whole industry that's looking for people like you. I think it's of great value to the Navy. Some, some posters were put together, you know, your future is in the ocean technology industry. Uh, we're just releasing these posters along with the curriculum. We've had them for years, but um, there was no place to send young people to learn about careers in blue tech. And that's one of the things that we've done. I invite you to, if you want to learn more, go to our 160 page uh, TMA Blue Tech website. There's lots to see and do and learn. Um, and we will be eventually uh, making the curriculum available. Um, we need funding to give it to underserved communities, but for those that can afford it, they'll be able to, to utilize uh, and pay for matrixes and various other things that hopefully will help them. Uh, we have a physical incubator, but we think we, we really act as if we were our, a, an accelerator. That's what we do. And our biggest strength is our global network of uh, Blue Tech clusters, companies, and contacts. Um, we helped put together the world's first um, kind of alliance of Blue Tech clusters. So this is the Blue Tech Cluster Alliance. You like, you can tell we like the word Blue Tech. Um, we're branding every time we can. So hopefully you'll all walk away and use the word Blue Tech many times in the course of the day. Um, we pulled together 10 leading Blue Tech uh, clusters from eight countries. Uh, you can see our mission there and you can see our goals. We typically have bi-monthly calls. This has allowed us to work together in very unique ways and to uh, promote Blue Tech internationally. So if I go to Norway, like I did last October to the Our Ocean Conference, which was hosted there, I was there with my partner cluster and the two of us worked the room. So my Norwegian cluster partner who knows the people in Norwegian government and I knew some of the US government people that were there, including uh, Craig McLean, the acting chief scientist to NOAA was there, um, who will be a Blue Tech Week as well. So we, we work together in that, as we all know, uh, there's strength in numbers and the ability to do things together. That also led to something that we are recently, uh, recently unveiled. I think this may be new for Kate as well, uh, but in, on June 30, we signed an MOU, we TMA Blue Tech, with three other partners to create, essentially will be the world's first publicly available long distance uh, uh, testing facilities for uh, robotics and, um, and sensors. Um, and so our goal is to create persistent uh, persistence uh, presence in the ocean. We've talked to the European Space Agency and NASA and NOAA and, and uh, the National Oceanography Center in the UK uh, and many others, uh, the Navy of course, um, and everybody has expressed interest. Um, we're just now kind of moving into our second phase, which is getting partners together for this. But the thing that's so interesting is, let's just say, as Kate knows, I'm involved also with a very innovative, small unmanned surface vessel company, and we're in San Diego. And so we can go out to the Catalan Islands and maybe in a week out and back. But after that, it's Hawaii or bust. That's a hell of a long ways. And if halfway across it breaks down or gets caught in netting or uh, seaweed, um, it's really prohibitive to go out and pick something up. But if you look here from Porto in the north to the Azores and then between the Azores Islands, these are all manageable distances and no place is more than 500 miles, 475 miles actually, from, from where if you broke down right in the middle that somebody could come and help you and pick you up. Um, so we think it's pretty cool and right now there are Robotic centers in Porto and in Plocan, our partner, uh, and you know we are partnered with Formosiano, the national cluster in uh, Portugal, um, Plocan, uh, a cluster in Spain, and of course we're the largest cluster in the United States. So the four of us went together, we've got our logo, um, and we're going to be building, or they will be building, 
robotic centers in the Azores, uh, in Lisbon, the Portuguese Navy is going to be sponsoring a new robotic center, and then there'll be one in Madeira, and then there is a 24-7 center, but we'll be grafting onto that kind of a one for companies. So now if you're an NGO or you're a military, that for example, it, you can't see it here, but this is, so call this a big loop around the mouth to the Mediterranean. If you care about, for argument's sake, submarines going in, um, it'd be nice to have people gathering information for METOC purposes, um, potentially for just knowing who's going through and transiting an area. So we see lots of advantages in this. This would not have been possible without our, our relationship with our partners around the world. Um, this is our Blue Tech Week uh, coming up. Um, uh, Kate and I were just talking about that. She's tried to come for the last couple of years, but since we're virtual, there's no reason she can't come for part of it this year. Um, one day will be uh, California and U.S. Blue Economy Initiatives and Policy. So Kate, I hope you can at least join us for part of that one. Um, 2019, we had 686 people from 18 countries, including 16 clusters and 150 companies. Those were clusters and clusters in formation. Those were both ocean and water tech clusters. Um, and you can see 2020. Okay, I'm getting to the end um, because I wanted to only talk for about 45 minutes and then leave time open because I understand by about 1.15 some people will be running to classes. I said before, and I'll just come back again, blue tech is critical to identify and solve problems. The Navy through ONR and, and other organizations, the you know, UTIC in, in, in Newport and others, uh, I think have done really great work. Um, but, and, and after the Second World War, uh, probably, I don't know the numbers, so I think we've all seen a little bit of research and how over time the private sector continues to invest in, in often doing things that uh, are faster to market than, than a, a government uh, funding program. Um, and so both are very important. Um, uh, you know, we think ONR and DARPA and all those guys play an incredibly important role, but there's a lot of work being done in the private sector as well. And so these are all issues that are important for DOD, autonomy, autonomous vessels, big data, cybersecurity, food security, ocean energy, ocean observation, pollution mitigation, port maritime shipping efficiency, and making sure we have enough water wastewater. You know, those poor people in Guatemala and Honduras that are in decade long droughts and are moving north, it's not because they want to leave, it's because um, they're, you know, they would just, they would starve to death if they stayed where they are. Those problems are proliferating as climate change happens, whether it's in the middle of Italy, which is having problems or the Middle East where we're seeing the temperatures soaring to levels they've never been before. Uh, but these are big problems and blue tech again for us means both ocean and water. Um, so on the water side, we're interested in recycling, uh, conservation, and of course the creation of new water, uh, whether it's just taking it out of the air um, through evaporation or it is, it is uh, uh, desalination of some kind. Um, upper left again, ocean represents 71% of the world's surface, 90 to 99% of habitable earth. People, it, we live on a two-dimensional world. Even if you're in the Andes Mountains, you're still two-dimensional, whereas the ocean is essentially three-dimensional, and then you throw time in, and everything's moving. The border between Mexico and the United States is very static, unless there's an earthquake that makes a difference. But, you know, you throw something in the water in, in Alaska, and it's down in Costa Rica in a week. Uh, if we didn't know that before, we knew it from, from uh, Fukushima. So why is this relevant? I mean, every topic I just talked about is relevant, but in a larger kind of geopolitical sense, every great power throughout history has been a naval innovator. You know, the Phoenicians, the Egyptians, the, the, the Venetians, the, the Greeks, the Italians, the uh, the, the Portuguese, the Spanish, the UK, the United States, without naval innovation and power, um, it has been hard to uh, be a world power. Um, we believe that, you know, the, I think we hope us all believe that we need global partners. And one way to develop that relationship is cluster to cluster, company to company, 
we think that's a way to build bridges and build relationships that promote collaboration, innovation, respect, and trust. So I think you know you put into a port somewhere, and if somebody says, "Oh, I've been working with somebody in your country," that's obviously uh, wonderful. It, it only helps the sailors. It helps our vessels. It, it helps uh, in the trust factor. Great technologies are being developed globally, and we can help source them. We started something in April called Lutec Global Connect, and every month we bring three companies from three countries, and we're always trying to find very innovative technologies. And we find them in Iceland and Switzerland and Norway and anywhere around the world, and we are trying to help bring them forward. Um, support for the creation of blue economy clusters in developing countries can promote smart, sustainable development. We can't be good stewards just in the United States and, and Europe and Japan and Korea, you know, a few developed countries, Australia and New Zealand. We've got to be developing this around the world. I mean, that ocean touches 100 and I think it's 61 countries of the 186 or whatever it is in the world. You know, there aren't that many countries, uh, you know, the poor Bolivians, for example, there aren't that many countries that don't have ocean access. Sometimes it's slivers, you know, but, but uh, you know, and the, and, the, and the Bolivians and the Chileans fought a war and the Chileans won and they took away ocean access to Bolivia and Bolivia has been wanting to try and get back ever since. Um, so it, we need to help them. And I don't mean the Navy has to be doing this, but to me, the Department of State, uh, US AID, and people like that because it's the right thing to do and it will it pays dividends. Dual use technologies drives down the price. Clusters can help identify them. Uh, as I said before, it's increasingly important in a re resource constrained world. Um, I spent a couple of slides looking at blue stem and aqua optimism. We think that's an amazing way to excite our youth for the future. You know, you so show a child a, an angler fish with its, you know, the light hanging out in front with these great big teeth trying to attract somebody and you go, oh my God, you know, but they'll remember that. And when you talk about how much of the ocean is still unexplored uh, and you say you can be part of creating a sustainable ocean economy, we'll be doing this a hundred years from now. I mean, this is such a big opportunity. I believe, and I hope most of us would believe that we're probably gonna cure breast cancer or ovarian cancer from something from the ocean as opposed to something from Mars. Um, and, and so we have an ability, uh, if we can excite our youth, whether they go into telecom or healthcare later is not important. It's, it's exciting them early on. And we believe that hopefully what we're doing will, will add to that opportunity. Um, promoting blue tech promotes awareness of the importance of the ocean. At the beginning, I talked about how little research has been done, how people are waking up and that means if people say, my God, of course the ocean's important. And of course funding is important for the US Navy and US Marine Corps as our wet you know, services. Um, I, I, it may not be a direct line, but holy mackerel, it is an important indirect line. And of course, it's the right thing to do. If we care about our future, if we care about the ocean uh, and water and, and climate change, then dealing with it and blue tack and from my point of view, clusters are critically important. So I always like to, I, somebody once said this from, from, um, from uh, Esri, uh, Don Wright, uh, Dr. Don Wright, uh, the chief scientist uh, used this quote, if you wanna go quickly, go alone. If you wanna go far, go together. And I've always used it and I always credit her for it. Uh, we need each other, we need to collaborate. And so I will say thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, Kate, it's always you know a pleasure to work with you in any way we can, uh, and then contact details for us. Um, obviously, uh, Kate knows how to get a hold of me, and um, uh, we are happy to take any questions uh, via Kate. And then I offered, if if this goes on uh, beyond the the I guess one thirty year time, um, we would change it over from. From, uh, from chat feature, assuming people have questions for me, uh, we're happy to talk more live, but you also can get a hold of me if anybody wants to talk one-on-one. -on -one. So with that, I'm gonna say thank you for your attention. I know it was enforced if you were here. Uh, you couldn't raise your hand, you couldn't talk or anything else, but uh, uh, thank you very much for, for listening and uh, I look forward to answering any questions. I'm gonna stop sure. sharing at this point 
okay, unless somebody wants me to go uh, back. But yeah, yeah, hold on to that. Oh, well, that's right. Um, well, it's easy I'm to go back use, to. Uh, we're going to ask in a moment about the EEZ slide, but while you go back to that, I'm going to use moderator privilege. We have uh, several questions lined up, but one practical question, one substantive. Uh, the practical question is,